The F-86 Sabre is one of those aircraft that established itself as a legend of aerial warfare, mainly remembered for its epic battles against its great rival, the MiG-15. During the Korean War, the Sabre was pretty much the mainstay fighter for many Western-orientated nations during the 1950s. Indeed, the F-86 would still be a mainstay for many countries into the 1970s and wouldn't actually be retired from frontline service until 1994. But what isn't so well remembered is that this remarkable aircraft actually originated from humble roots. More surprisingly, naval roots. This is the story of the North American FJ Fury, an aircraft that created a legend and also evolved from very limited origins into a genuinely formidable fighter aircraft, and one which is quite frankly kind of surprising that it ranks as a forgotten aircraft. The first of the Furies, the FJ-1, originated in the requirement issued by the US Navy in 1944 for one of those fancy new jet aircraft that seemed to be making ripples amongst aeronautical designers. In fact, the US Navy was so keen not to get left behind that they ordered four separate aircraft designs. The McDonald XFD-1 Phantom, the McDonald XF-2D-1 Banshee, the Vault XF-6U-1 Pirate, and the North American XFJ-1 Fury. For the latter, and because of the desire of the Navy to get a jet into service ASAP, North American largely went with what they knew, which was the P-51 Mustang, probably not a bad basis for building a new fighter. Like the P-51, the new FJ-1 had a frameless teardrop canopy, a cockpit mounted high up in the fuselage to give the pilot excellent visibility, and thin straight wings. The difference came in the power plant, which was a single Allison J-35 turbojet that produced 3,820 pounds of force in the prototype aircraft and 4,000 pounds of force in the production ones. This was mounted within the fuselage, and North American elected to go for a single nose air inlet in contrast to the wing root or cheek mounted inlets of the other American jets in development at the time, giving the FJ-1 that distinctive tubby, barrel-like look that was common in the early jets that used nose inlets. The initial hope was that at least one of these jet aircraft types would be available for service before the end of the war, and so in May 1945, 100 FJ-1s were ordered practically off the drawing board. As it was, the war ended somewhat sooner than had been expected, and so the order for the FJ-1 was cut to just three prototypes and 30 production aircraft, with the development rush slowed down. So it wasn't until September 1946 that the XFJ-1 made its first flight, and deliveries of the production aircraft to the US Navy began in October 1947, with the FJ-1 only serving with a single squadron, VF-5A. With the FJ-1, this squadron was the first operational jet fighter squadron in the US Navy, landing aboard the USS Boxer in March 1948. But even by this point, the FJ-1 was already recognised as a very limited design, and its top speed of 547 miles per hour, while not bad for a first generation jet fighter, was soon surpassed, and so it was that the frontline service of the FJ-1 was extremely short, only 14 months and they were swiftly transferred to the US Navy Reserve before being retired completely in 1953. And that could very well have been it. A rather unremarkable aircraft that would be memorable for conducting a few firsts and for an extremely short service life. But as said, the Fury was to lay the groundwork for a line of much more famous and successful descendants. As the FJ-1 was in development in 1945, North American had proposed to the United States Army Air Force, as it was then, that they could build a much improved aircraft derived from that basic design. This was authorised, and when German research and data on jet aircraft was captured and became available to the North American team at the end of the war, the new aircraft was altered to have swept wings and a longer, slimmer fuselage. This, the XP-86, was the first of the Sabres, and though a far more formidable aircraft than its progenitor, the lineage was still clear to see. And the success of the subsequent Sabre would mean that, somewhat ironically, the US Navy soon wanted their own version. The Navy had stuck with straight-wing designs largely because of the problems that swept-wing aircraft had with higher stalling speeds and tricky low-level performance, significant issues for carrier operations. 
But the war in Korea soon demonstrated that the US Navy's Panthers and Banshees were outclassed by the Soviet MiG-15. And so in January 1951, a crash program was initiated to develop a naval sabre. This was essentially the F-86E configured for carrier use, and as such had just about nothing in common with the original FJ-1 anymore. But the US Navy went with retaining the Fury name, designating the aircraft as the FJ-2. I've seen several explanations on this, mainly around it being a way for the Navy to con the necessary money for the FJ-2 out of Congress. After all, this wasn't a new aircraft. Oh no, it was a development of an existing Navy aircraft. Or at least, that is how the Navy painted it. Of course, the retention of the Fury name might also have been a point-blank refusal to admit that the Navy was having to adopt an Air Force plane as an emergency measure, which, considering the traditional antipathy between the two services, was probably a handy extra in choosing the name. Because the adoption of the Sea Sabre, sorry, I mean the FJ-2 Fury, was indeed an emergency that meant the program rocketed along. North American first proposed a naval sabre on the 30th of January 1951. On February 10th, before any development work had been done or prototypes even ordered, the US Navy issued a contract for 300 of the new fighters. So it was that on the 27th of December 1951, the first FJ-2 flew. The first two prototypes were essentially F-86E Sabres modified for testing carrier handling on the type, while the production aircraft had quite substantial changes to the design to better fit the Navy's needs. On top of these standard adaptions such as arrestor gear and foldable wings, the FJ-2s had wider undercarriages and armaments switched from the Sabre's 650 caliber Browning machine guns to 420mm cannon. For power plant, the aircraft used the General Electric J47 JE2 engines, rated at £6,000 of force, and the wings were based on those used on the early models of the F-86F. Top speed was 676 miles per hour at sea level, only fractionally slower than the contemporary F-86F of the United States Air Force, even though the FJ-2 was around half a tonne heavier. However, it wasn't all rosy. Despite the US Navy's subterfuge that the FJ-2 was basically the development of the FJ-1, the aircraft really wasn't suitable as a carrier aircraft, being very tricky in deck landings. Concerns on this, and the fact that North American was almost completely at capacity building Sabres for the Korean War, meant that after the initial rush, development slowed down. The first production FJ-2 Fury wasn't received by the US Navy until late 1952, and by the time of the ceasefire in July 1953, only seven had been delivered. The production order was slashed to 200, and because of concerns about its carrier suitability, the entire order was handed over to the US Marine Corps for use from land bases. But this still didn't mark the end of the Fury line, as a new model was already well in development, the FJ-3. In 1950, Curtis Wright obtained a license to build the British Sapphire jet engine. This weighed only slightly more than the J-47, but offered considerably more power, rated at 7,800 pounds of force. The US Navy decided that this was what they wanted in their Furies, and in 1952 ordered a new variant fitted with it, the FJ-3. The new engine entailed making changes to the air inlet to make it bigger, as well as a redesigned fuselage, increased ammunition load for the 420mm cannon, and additional cockpit armour. Deliveries of the FJ-3 commenced in December 1953, and the US Navy seems to have been happy with the new Fury, though it would play second fiddle to the Grumman Cougar that was to be the US Navy's primary carrier fighter throughout the first half of the 1950s. That isn't to say though that the new Fury didn't have its moments. Indeed, the type was the first fighter to land on the new supercarrier, the USS Forrestal, in 1956 and the FJ-3 would see continuous improvements made to it as production continued, including improved wings for better agility, provision for in-flight refuelling, and the capability to carry bombs, rockets, and the new AIM-9 Sidewinder heat-seeking missile that was coming into service. The FJ-3 would fly cover for the American intervention in Lebanon in 1958, but other than that, enjoyed a short and quiet frontline career serving into the 1960s and being redesignated as the F-1C in 1962, ending its days as controllers for target drones and regular cruise missiles. All told, 538 
FJ3s were built, and that was a pretty respectable number for an aircraft that was largely eclipsed by its contemporaries. But even then, the US Navy wasn't finished with the Fury, and started a program to build the final variant, the FJ4. And this aircraft, if perhaps a bit of a chonker in contrast to its streamlined forebears and Sabre brethren, was possibly the most formidable of all the Sabre variants. I would say Fury variants, but let's be honest, the FJ-4 was so far removed now from the FJ-1, it is kind of surprising that the name was retained. Especially considering as the Grumman Panther Cougar combo arguably saw less radical development, but they got different names. The FJ-4, meanwhile, was almost unrecognisable in comparison to the FJ-1, and in fact an almost totally new design even compared to the FJ-3. Originally designed to be a naval interceptor, the FJ-4 carried 50% more fuel than the FJ-3. To accommodate this, an additional tank was fitted under the engine, and the wings configured as wet, in which the whole wing was hollow and served as a fuel tank. The wing control services were also radically changed over the previous Furies, having high lift flaps, a controllable drooping leading edge, and mid-span control surfaces. With a shortened fuselage, now fitted with a distinctive spine, the FJ-4 was truly the naval aircraft that had been wanted from the beginning, resolving the handling issues that had long been an issue with the series. Armament was the standard 4 20mm cannon, but the first FJ-4s also had four underwing hardpoints for carrying AIM-9s. Deliveries began in February 1955, and 152 of the FJ-4 fighters were built for the US Navy and Marines before the final production variant, the FJ-4B, entered service. This took the FJ-4 and turned it into a heavy-hitting fighter-bomber. The wings were further strengthened, and payload was doubled to 6,000 pounds of ordnance on six hardpoints. Power plant was now the J65W16A that produced 7,700 pounds of force, and this gave the FJ-4s a top speed of 680 miles per hour. But most significantly, the FJ-4B was configured to use both the new Bullpup standoff missile and fitted with the low altitude bombing system that enabled the type to toss bomb nuclear weapons. The 222 FJ-4Bs built therefore provided the US Navy with one of its primary strike aircraft throughout the late 1950s and early 60s, eventually being displaced by the A-4 Skyhawk, making their last flights off aircraft carriers in 1962 before being relegated to the reserve until they were retired in 1964. All told, North American delivered 1,112 Furies, which makes their comparative lack of reputation somewhat surprising. Of course, they never saw any combat, which probably helps explain their status as a forgotten aircraft, but the significance of the Fury in the story of the F-86 means they probably should deserve more recognition. Because, let's be honest, while I've titled this as Sea Sabres, we could probably refer to the F-86 family as the Land Furies.